Hello, and welcome to Spokane County Spotlight. I'm Spokane County Commissioner Shelley O'Quinn, and my guest today is Jack Nesbitt, an educator and acclaimed author who possesses a wealth of knowledge about the Inland Northwest. Jack, welcome to Spokane County Spotlight. Thanks for inviting me. Jack has written numerous books about the history and geography of the Pacific Northwest, from the illustrations of naturalist David Douglas to the exploration and maps of David Thompson. But today, the focus is on the communities of Southeast Spokane County, their history, events, and especially a mammoth archeological discovery. Southeast Spokane County is a short drive from Spokane and the city of Spokane Valley. It's a region surrounded by evergreen forests that open onto thousands of acres of rolling wheat fields and cozy farming communities. While the state of Washington has dozens of scenic byways, none of them takes a visitor through the five towns of Spangle, Waverly, Leita, Fairfield, and Rockford. Spokane County staff came to the rescue and have created a loop tour that starts in Spokane, winds through all five communities and some beautiful scenery, and ends in the Spokane Valley. It's the perfect day trip. We're going to start our day trip off with the Slavin Family Conservation Area. As you start out on Highway 195, Spokane County is a conservation area that's located between Spokane and Spangle. The Slavin Family Conservation Area is 628 acres of restored wetland and waterfowl habitat and there's a loop trail for the best views. After taking a short hike, if you need a break, our next stop is Spangle, which was settled in 1872 by William Spangle, an early pioneer. You can wet your whistle at the Spangle Saloon or have a snack at the Harvester Restaurant. Some believe that Spangle is where Butch Cassidy spent his last years and died in 1937 but the date and place of his death have never been confirmed. After traveling through Spangle, we'll get to the town of Waverly. This is the second smallest town in the state of Washington. The town was first settled in 1878 by immigrants, and by the turn of the century, Waverly had a new train station for a branch of the Oregon Railroad and navigation company and several grain warehouses. It was also the home to a sugar beet factory built by the Washington State Beet Sugar Company. The factory cost $500,000 to build. Now remember, this is 1899, and it included a 1,400-acre farm. They employed 150 workers in the factory and another 400 workers in the fields during harvest. The factory closed in 1910. Waverly has recently moved a 100-year-old schoolhouse from its original location outside of town to save it from further damage. The schoolhouse is being restored, and the front of the building will be used to educate children about what it was like to go to school in the 1900s. The back of the schoolhouse will house historical memorabilia, photos of the sugar beet factory, and other photos from the town's past. Finally, we reach Leita, and we are about halfway through our tour of southeast Spokane County. Leita was settled in 1872, and unlike many of the other towns that were named for their founders, Leita's name is Nez Perce and means camping place with plentiful food. Today, Leita is home to some new businesses that are connected to the town's history. First is the old Leita Schoolhouse. This imposing brick building was saved from demolition and has been remodeled into a beautiful and unique wedding event center. Another exciting development in Leita is the restoration of the Old Swan Hotel, which is privately owned and being restored to its former glory. The barn on the property was used for the horses of the guests and the chicken coop kept everyone fed well. However, the big news in Leita these days is also connected to the town's history, or should I say prehistory? And now I'm going to turn to my guest, author and historian Jack Nesbitt, for the story of the Leita Mammoth. Jack, welcome, and you know, let's start our adventures in Leita with our, with our historic mammoth. Well, it's, it's a funny story it, from all kinds of different angles, but it begins sort of after the tribal wars. It, uh, the area there in Southeast County and the whole Northeast Washington was slow to settle because people were wary of what was going on. 
And in the early 1870s, uh, homestead families started creeping up from Walla Walla. One uh, was named the Copeland family, who had bounced all around the Midwest and through Washington several different times, as many of these homesteaders had. So they knew what was going on. Um, one of the boys had been in the mining business, had been in the Civil War. They had all kinds of skills, like many of these people did. And they settled right in the town of Lataw. And they just got going on a farm, and there was a boggy area down by a bend in the creek there that, where some cows got mired in. And one of the younger boys named Alonzo later wrote a wonderful account of them going down with these poles and just sticking them down into the mud. And, and that's an area where there's a lot of silt backed up from the Ice Age floods, and there's no rocks there. So they went down and hit something solid. Everybody gets excited, and they run back up to the barn and tie a hay hook onto one of the poles and go back down and hook up stuff. And they just came up with the most remarkable stuff. And everybody in town gathered around, and um, the older brother, Ben, who's sort of the ringleader of all this, <laughs> gets everybody in the community involved and gets them digging a channel from the mired bog out to Lataw Creek so it will drain. This is sort of mining 101. And, and um, they drain it out and pull up more than two tons of bones from at least four different mammoths, but lots of other animals. And Alonzo describes birds and turtles and stuff. But the, the problem from a paleontological point of view is, is Alonzo describes some of them as being soft like soap and not well fossilized. And a layer of, of blue clay on the bottom where they found stuff that was really well fossilized. And underneath that layer they find gravel, which we assume is flood deposits. So it's kind of a, it, it excites local geologists and paleontologists, not just local but from all over the place, with what it could tell, the story it could tell, and the time that it could reveal about our place. Now, I read an article that you wrote for the Inlander a couple years back describing the Leita Mammoth. Can you tell some of our listening audience, what did this family do with some of these bones after their discovery? Like, <laughs> like anybody, they tr tried to figure out how to monetize them. <laughs> and and uh, they threw them on a wagon and took them immediately to the next town, which was Colfax at the time, and there was a pelvis involved that was big. Mammoth pelvises are big, the girdle. And they described people, they, they charged 25 cents to walk under the pelvis. And they described local politicians coming and walking through the pelvis and get, you know, the, the kinds of things that have happened at a county fair. And then there's a whole circuit, so they continue on down to Dayton and then Walla Walla and then the Dalles and then end up at Portland and Willamette. And just by chance, there's, it's 1876 <laughs> and it's the centennial of our nation and there's all this stuff going on and all this excitement about the opening of the West and the 100 year anniversary of the nation and they just perfectly time it to get in on that. And I guess one of the things I should really emphasize is um, when you and I were down in Leitar a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had this letter that I put up from uh, that was written in 1919 from a Leitar resident describing sort of a frenzy of other of other farm kids going down to their springs and bogs and trying to look for stuff, and um, doing the same thing. And there was another. There was a guy who came up at the talk saying, "Oh yeah, my dad got something out of a bog and took it down to Walla Walla to sell." Or no, somebody else got something out of a bog and took it down to Walla Walla to sell. And that's where his dad bought the farm where he lives on in Lake Tahoe. So it, it caused a lot of economic movement, which is what everybody wants to create with things like scenic byways. It got people moving and, in, and seeing new country and, and really enjoying it all, enjoying the fun of it all. Now I know the Copeland family is the major find, but I believe there's another um, find close by that's Be, another large right, mammoth right. discovery. Be, because, because there was really good communication between all these early homestead towns, there were many more people living there than there are now, um, the word spread. And there was another family at Rosalia, a couple of Irish guys named Donahoe, who went out in their spring and got a beautifully fossilized mammoth skull. And it became a competitor on the fair circuit with the Copeland bones. And um, 
the, and both of them turn out to be real significant in fossil history, in the history of mammoth taxonomy, I guess you would say, and made their ways to different big museums back east over the next few years. And um, uh, the fun that my wife Claire and I had and that an Eastern Washington student named Charles Luttrell had who was getting his master was just trying to track all that and it was mm -hmm. so funny and, and there were so many records of them and so many newspaper articles of these bones showing up in town and everybody rushing down to see them that it, that it became um, sort of a mirror of, of how you do things, you know, how, how a community can get excited and do all kinds of positive things that have much further ramifications than where they start. Yep. Speaking of communities being excited, jumping to the present <laughs> right, really right. Uh, for just a few moments, you know, the town of Leyta is uh, very excited about um, sharing the history of the Leyta mammoth with the region and, and beyond. And uh, they have started to dig into the history and realize that this is a, this is a great way to pull um, others from outside the community into their community and a great opportunity for them to rally around. Um, while it's unfortunate that we can't bring any of those mammoth bones back to the community, uh, I know that they're working on developing a, uh, a steel sculpture of a mammoth, ideally uh, a life-size mammoth. We may have to start with the baby mammoth first to, to um, give the idea and move forward, but they have all kinds of exciting um, passions and history that they want to bring together to really tell their story. So if someone were to say, well, where are these bones right now? I know you've mentioned that they're all over the <laughs> East Coast. Let's talk for a few minutes on where, where are they at this moment? So what happened was both the, the Donahoe skull, as it's called, the Pine Creek skull, as we should call it, and, and what they call the Copeland bones or what is is the Latal mammoth to people from Latal. <laughs> they both ended up in Portland, which was the big city at the time, and they both got purchased by big time museums. There it's a very they went through a lot of permutations. There was there was a lot of one pieces of them sold off, but but basically the Donahoe skull went to the Museum of Natural History in New York and became the type specimen of Columbia mammoth, which is our state fossil. So in other words, our state fossil and, and the main mammoth that's in northern North America was defined by a fossil that came out of Pine Creek. The Copeland bones, of which there were a lot, um, like 13 tusks we're talking about came out of the bog below the house. Um, they end up at the Field Museum in Chicago, which is having a death wrestling match with Museum of Natural History to be the bigger, more famous museum, as is anything in Chicago competing with New York. And it became the first mounted mammoth in North America. There had been some mounted woolly mammoths in Russia, but none had been done in North America yet. And it caused a huge excitement. There had been uh, and and this is this is part of the story, I guess, is you can't talk about mammoths without talking about their effect on people. They, mm -hmm. a, as we saw when we went to the fire station in Leitol, you know, it's like a standing room only cloud. There's kids. It's it's an age neutral, gender neutral kind of thing. Some people just go nuts over them. Ready and that to has take happened out their forever. shovels and yes, start exactly. digging out. <laughs> Absolutely, and that yeah. has happened forever. So when. When uh, one of uh, the most famous early paintings is America, is, is Peel's painting of a mastodon being removed from a dig in upstate New York, and all these people standing around from all over the community and them digging up bones. And it's been a story right through, and the fact that these real significant bones come from here is, is mostly serendipity, but it, everybody, it's like everybody in Chicago and New York was primed to get the right bones, and these happen to be the right bones, which says, this Palouse country in a somewhat altered state was perfect mammoth habitat. And then that makes, uh, as, as, as my wife Claire and I work together, and she's been saying since we started that what needs to happen is to have a, a bunch of mammoths up on a hill in the Palouse, mm -hmm. you know, where you get these amazing, on this driving tour you get these amazing visions of where you're going in and out of hills that look like waves in the ocean and to have some mammoths come up on the waves and then disappear and then come up again when you go around another bend, that is very evocative to people. There's no question about that. 
Oh, that would be great to see, similar <laughs> yeah. to the, the wild stallions that we see over in Vantage. The, the David would... Govadier statue of, of um, Grandma Let's Loose the Horses is, is, um, gets more comments, is certainly the most well-known sculpture in the state, and, and it's because David knew where to put it and knew how to execute it so that you got different visions of it. And mammoths are bigger and more exciting yeah. than horses. And they were do that's what they were doing the same thing. And horses aren't native to Washington, but mammoths are. So you sort of have to readjust your idea of what our place is. That's always good, too. Yeah. That's always a good thing to do. It would be great to see the community's vision come alive. If we, <laughs> it would. They could it develop would. some sculptures <laughs> down in the Palouse. Yes. And um, what a great addition to our scenic drive. Yeah. So, for any of our listening audience that is interested, they can find um, the, a complete skeleton of the Leitau Mammoth in the Field Museum of Chicago. Yeah, the, the Leitau Museum, and we heard this, this is another thing we heard, over the, it's been on display there for more than 100 years. It's been a, a uh, featured display in a very large, very world-class museum for more than a century. And, and they keep moving it because it's a museum. They have to keep refreshing mm -hmm. what they look. And so there was somebody at the, the talk we did in Latos saying, oh, they, don't, they call it the uh, Northwest Mammoth. They don't even call it a Spokane Mammoth, much less a Latos Mammoth, which is what they want to call it. And so they're sending, there's a letter writing campaign to them and stuff, and they've moved it. The, the field bought the T-Rex suit. And they've put that in front now, and that kind of has displaced the late tall mammoth because Tyrannosaurus rexes are even more appealing to 13-year-old boys than, you know, than mammoths are. But um, the, 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 the guy that we've talked to there, Bill Simpson, who is the, the curator of the yeah. whole place, he thinks it's a great thing. He is totally willing to talk about it and share what he can with it. What we have to understand, uh, and, and again, the, the Northwest Museum, what is now the Northwest Museum mm -hmm. of Arts and Culture, what was then the His Eastern Washington Historical Society, they've wanted a mammoth of their own since the beginning. And they went back to Leitau in 1919 to try to dig one out and failed. There was another attempt in 1980 that was shut down for various reasons. But everybody knows that there's still, the story is still sort of underground there. So that lends another element to the whole thrill of it because usually if it's a fossil bone you get it out and it's done that's not what's happening here ben copeland always said there's more there so you can expect to find not a whole mammoth possibly but lots of megafauna bones lots of clear geology mm -hmm. timed out by the ice age floods and the volcanoes that have gone off in the cascades and and a fuller story as to what eastern washington is and again uh so that when you drive the scenic tour, you can sort of feel your way through time like that. Do you foresee there being an archaeological dig any time in the future? Um, uh, since that, since I saw you last, I have gone and visited the guys at Eastern who would do that. It's um, archaeological and historic services there. It's a very well-respected outfit that works within the uh, university. Jerry Gaum and Stan Goff are the two guys who did it. They, Jerry, so, so here's all you really need to know. Jerry Gaum grew up in Michigan. He went to the Field Museum when he was six years old. He saw the late tall mammoth and was knocked out by it. And he has a career as an archaeologist doing this stuff. I mean, that's how, that's how powerful it is. And yes, he would like to do it. There, a lot of things have to happen. But um, he is patient, and, and time passes, and people get more into it. So you have to have, and, and, and again, this is why it's such a great community project. There has to be a lot of community cooperation for it to work. That's the important part. I believe we had over 90 people mm -hmm. at the meeting that we attended, we the presentation that you made. And, and I know after listening to uh, an hour on the history of Leighton the Mammoth, I was ready to go grab my shoulder, <laughs> my shovel, and my kids, you know, my 14-year-old and my 8-year-old, and say, yeah. let's go dig. And I'm fairly certain that the kids in front of me were feeling the same way, yes, yes. that they were ready to go out and start digging in all of the... the um, wetland that they can find down in Leita. And <laughs> so what any educator wants to do or any community developer wants to do is channel the energy that's yeah. coming into some positive way. And I've seen that in many communities. I mean, again, it's everybody's got mammoths. And, and there's a, a, the town of Grangeville went through this process when they had a good find there. And they have a fiberglass mount outside of town that's very nice. The town of Moses Lake has a steel one. There's one in the Gallatin Valley. Uh, there's a guy in the Willamette at the moment. So you can, Leitau has the luxury 
of not only having the history of these terrific bones, but also to go around and see how other communities have done it and say which is the most practical for us, which, which will channel that energy in the most positive way. And I believe that what they have that is really, uh, will trump what anybody else has been able to do is they have the setting. They have those ocean waves of the Palouse Hills that if you take a cue from Govier and, and uh, artist, it's an artist job, you know, it's a design mm -hmm. job almost, yep. is to take a cue from that and make it so that if you're taking, if you happen to say, oh, well, let's take a day trip and go through Spangle and have a picnic on the scenic drive, you get different views of them as you kind of sink into this timeless world that we're talking about. Yep. Well, I know we're getting um, down to about the last five minutes or so. Share with us some final um, thoughts on the mammoth, some in interesting stories. I know when you, when we were talking down in Leita that you mentioned that um, it's rumored, maybe it's true, about some of the the bones being sold off in order to pay for college, oh, yes. college education right. for their kids. <clears throat> the youngest Copeland brother, I, we're pretty sure, went to Pacific University outside of, um, not the, the college uh, outside of Portland on a mammoth bone train. And there is another rib, a beautiful rib, at the Connor Museum at Washington State with a label on it that to me indicates that, that some guy, there, there's, there it is on the screen, but some, some guy who we know some funny things about uh, got a hold of this rib. We know that Ben Copeland was in the area at that time and traded stuff off, and, and his kid went to WSU at the time that this label was put on. So it's, you know, it's, it's trading stock, which I'd like even more. But, but it also indicates that the story continues to go on, that there, there will be bones that turn up somewhere or another, or there'll be another mammoth find somewhere nearby that's in the Ice Age floods matrix where you can date it out. Uh, in the long run, there will be people in association with them, and we can get excited about those kinds of interactions because what could be more fun than living with living mammoths instead of living with them, you know, sculpted metal mammoths out in the hills. But, all these things, it's like a uh, geography of the imagination problem where we want to get excited about it. They, we know they were here. We have to sort of dream them up. It's a dreaming project. That's why kids like them so much. And that's, what, that's who we all want to appeal to is the kids. The kids, and it's such an important piece of our history. Yes, and, yes. You know, it's, you know, I think we often overlook some of our local history. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yet to be able to uh, show students, you know, look here in just south of Spokane, we, we found you know, Leyton mammoth bones. They were a part of our history. And, and to celebrate that and get them excited and, again, to pull out the shovels and, and head right. down there. And you know, I'm just excited for the community and their wanting to um, revitalize this piece of their history. It's and to celebrate that story where a group of brothers who range in age from pre-teenagers to 35 years old, you know, and it's swept across those ages, and now we can give it back to that same kind of span, you know, that everybody can do it. Yeah. Age neutral, gender neutral, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it is. And, you know, it's such a great history. And we could spend all afternoon talking about um, the late Tom Mammoth and talking about um, the history of each of these communities. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I, the, the amount that I learned as I was, as I was reading through the, the histories of, of Spangle and Waverly, the Sugar Beet, company and to see how much money they invested back in 1899 was incredible and each town has its own unique history so thank you for sharing with us um, about Leita and the historic find and we're going to have to move our way on to um, the rest of our communities but I do want you to know that if in case you haven't had enough mammoth madness the Leita Mammoth Stampede Fun Run is on July 12th and the winners receive cash prizes this is a perfect opportunity for you to head down to uh, the town of Leita. And this fall, be sure to take in Leita's annual harvest celebration on Saturday, October 11th. They'll have live music, a farmer's market, hay rides, petting zoo, and lots of other activities. So mark your calendars. The next stop on our trip is Fairfield. So after leaving Leita, it's a picturesque drive to Fairfield, which was settled in 1888. Fairfield is known for the annual Flag Day celebration in mid-June, which includes a fun run and parade. And in 2010, Fairfield became the first city in the United States to celebrate Flag Day for 100 years. Fairfield is also where, where you'll find Southeast Spokane County Museum in the old city hall that was built in 1910. 
And a recent addition to the town is the Zytham Brewery, which is open on Friday and Saturday nights from 4 to 9. So a great opportunity to go down and visit. The last stop on our tour is Rockford. It was first settled in 1878, and for a time it was larger than the pioneer town of Spokane Falls, which later became the city of Spokane. Rockford is a great place to get out and stretch your legs and take in the views of Micah Peak or consider the history of the old transmission building that was constructed when electricity was still considered a newfangled idea. Check out the antiques and wine at Herd's Mercantile and grab a bite to eat at Fredneck Saloon and Beanery, the Harvest Moon, or Farmhouse Pizza. Every Saturday, there's a farmer's market and a flea market where you might find some unexpected treasures. If you enjoy county fairs, the town of Rockford will host the 70th annual Southeast Spokane County Fair on September 19th through 21st. The fair showcases the Palouse farming region and is a fun-filled event for the whole family. It also includes the Harvest Hustle Fun Run and the three-on-three -three basketball tournament. I hope that you have enjoyed this tour of Southeast Spokane County. And thank you, Jack, for joining us and sharing so much about the region's history and artifacts. If you're interested in taking this trip, please visit Spokane County's website. On the home page, click on the icon, Discover Southeast Spokane County, and you'll be able to access the map and information about upcoming events. I'm Commissioner Shelley O'Quinn, and thank you for joining us today for Spokane County Spotlight.